Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. If you like what you hear, please make sure to subscribe. And now, on with our story time. Following the sidewalk, which borders each street in Pompeii, and deprives the English of all claim to this invention, Octavian suddenly found himself face to face with a beautiful young man of about his own age. He was clad in a saffron-colored tunic with a mantle of snowy linen as supple as cashmere. The sight of Octavian in his frightful modern hat, girthed about with a scanty black frock, his legs confined in pantaloons, and his feet cramped in well-polished boots, seemed to surprise the young Pompeian in much the same way as one of us, would feel astonished to meet on the boulevard de Grand some Iowa Indian or native, bedecked with his feathers, necklace of bear's claws, or whimsical tattooing. Nevertheless, being a well-bred young man, he did not burst out laughing in Octavian's face, and, pitying the poor barbarian who had lost his way, no doubt, In that Greco-Roman city, he said to him, in a soft, clear voice, Ad Venus Hall. Nothing could be more natural than that. An inhabitant of Pompeii, in the reign of the divine, most powerful, and most august emperor Titus, should speak Latin. Yet Octavian started at hearing this dead tongue in a living mouth. It was then, indeed, that he congratulated himself on having been proficient in his college studies and taken the honors at the annual examinations. The Latin taught him by the university served him in good stead, and on that unique occasion, and calling back to mind some souvenirs of his college course, he returned the salutation of the Pompeian after the style of Iberus Illustribius, in a tolerably intelligible manner, but with a Parisian accent which forced the young man to smile, despite himself. Perhaps, said the Pompeian, it will be easier for you to converse in Greek. I am also acquainted with that language, for I studied at Athens. No, replied Octavian, I am even less familiar with Greek than with Latin. I am from the land of Gaul, from Paris. I know that country, he said. My grandfather served under the great Julius Caesar in the Gaelic Wars. But what a strange dress you wear. The Gauls who I saw at Rome were not thus attired. Octavian attempted to explain to the young Pompeian that twenty centuries had rolled by since the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar and that the fashions had changed. But he forgot his Latin, and indeed, to tell the truth, he had but little to forget. My name is Rufus Holconius, said the young man, and my house is at your service, unless, indeed, you prefer the freedom of the tavern. It is hard by the public house of Albanus, near the gate of the suburb of Augustus Felix, in the inn of Serenius, son of Publius, just at the second turn. But if you wish, I will be your guide through this city, in which you do not seem to be acquainted. Young barbarian, I, like you, although you endeavored to impose upon my credulity by pretending that the Emperor Titus, who now reigns, died two thousand years ago, and that the Nazarian, whose infamous followers were plastered with pitch and burned to illuminate Nero's gardens, rules sole master of the deserted heavens once the great gods have fallen. By Pollux, he continued. His eyes fell upon a rubric inscription at a street corner. You have just come in good time. The Casina of Platus, which has quite recently been put upon the stage, will be played today. It is a curious and laughable comedy which will amuse you. 
even if you only comprehend the pantomime of it. Come with me. It is nearly time for the play already. I will find you a place in the seat set apart for guests and strangers. Then Drufus led the way toward the little comic theater which the three friends had visited during the day. The Frenchman and the citizen of Pompeii proceeded along the street of the Fountains of Abundance and the street of the theaters, passing by the college, the Temple of Isis, and the studio of the sculptor. They entered the Odeon of Comic Theater by lateral vomitory. Through the recommendations of Rufus, Octavian obtained a seat near the proscenium in a part of the theater corresponding to our private boxes, which place you front upon the stage. All eyes were immediately turned upon him with good-natured curiosity, and a low whispering arose all through the amphitheater. The play had not yet commenced, and Octavian profited by the interval to examine the building. The semicircular seats terminated at either end by a magnificent lion's paw, sculpted in Vesuvian lava, receded, broadening as they rose, from an empty space corresponding to our parterre, but much narrower and paved in mosaic of Greek marble. The rows of seats widened above one another in regular gradation according to distance, and four stairways corresponding with the vomitories and sloping from the base to the summit of the amphitheater, divided it into five kunai, or wedge-shaped compartments, with a broad end overmost. The spectators, all furnished with tickets consisting of little slips of ivory, upon which were indicated in numerical order the row, division, and seat, together with the name of the play and its author, took their places without confusion, the magistrates, nobility, married men, young folks, and the soldiers, who attracted attention by the gleaming of their bronze helmets, all occupied different rows of seats. It was an admirable spectacle. Those beautiful togas and great white mantles displayed in the first row of seats, contrasting with the vari-colored garments of the women seated in the circle above, and then the gray capes of the populace who were assigned to the upper benches near the columns which supported the roof, and between which were visible glimpses of a sky, intensely blue as the azure background of the Panathenia. The fine spray aromatized with saffron fell from the friezes above in imperceptible mist, at once cooling and purifying the air. Octavian thought of the fetid emanations which vitilate the atmosphere of our modern theaters, theaters so uncomfortable that they may justly be considered places of torture rather than places of amusement, and he found that modern civilization had not, after all, made much progress. The curtain, sustained by a transverse beam, sank into the depths of the orchestra, the musicians took their seats, and the prologue appeared in grotesque attire, his face concealed by a frightful mask. Having saluted the audience and demanded applause, the prologue commenced a merry argumentation. Old plays, he said, were like old wine which improves with age, and Casina, so dear to the old, should not be less so to the young. All could take pleasure in it, some because they were familiar with it, others because they were not. Moreover, the play had been carefully remounted, and should be heard with a cheerful mind, without thinking about one's debts or one's creditors, for people were not liable to be arrested at the theater. It was a happy day, the weather was fair, and beautiful birds hovered over the forum, then he gave an analysis of the comedy about to be performed by the actors, with the minuteness of detail which shows how little the element of surprise entered into the theatrical pleasures of the ancient. He told how the aged Stalino, being enamored with his beautiful slave Casina, 
desired to marry her to his farmer, Olympiel, the complacent spouse whose place he himself would fill on the nuptial night. And how Lycostrata, wife of Stellino, in order to thwart the luxury of her vicious husband, sought to unite Cassina in marriage. His thought was to the groom, Chalinius, in disguise for Cassina, who, being discovered to be free, and of free birth, espouses the young master whom she loves, and by whom she is beloved. As in a reverie, the young Frenchmen watch the actors with their bronze-mouthed masks, exerting themselves upon the stage. The slaves ran hither and thither, feigning great haste. The old man wagged his head and extended his trembling hand. The matron with high words and scornful mien strutted in her importance and quarreled with her husband to the great delight of the audience. All these personages made their entrances and exit through three doors contrived in the foundation wall and communicating with the green room of the actors. The house of Stellino occupied one corner of the stage, and that of his old friend, Oximus, faced it on the opposite side. These decorations, though very well painted, represented the idea of a place rather than the place itself, like most of the vague scenery of the classic theaters. When the nuptial procession, pompously escorting the false Cassina, entered upon the stage, a mighty burst of laughter, such as Homer attributes to the gods, rang through all the amphitheater, and thunders of applause evoked the vibrating echoes of the closure. But Octavian heard no more, and saw no more of the play. In the circle of seats occupied by the women, he had just beheld a creature of marvelous beauty. From that moment, all the other charming faces which had attracted his attention became eclipsed as the stars. Before the face of Phoebus, all vanished, all disappeared as if in a dream. A mist clouded the circles of seats with their swarming multitudes, and the high-pitched voices of the actors seemed lost in infinite distance. His heart received a sudden shock as of electricity, and it seemed to him that sparks flew from his breast when the eyes of that woman turned upon him. She was dark and pale. Her locks, crisp flowing and black as the tresses of night, streamed backward over her temples after the fashion of the Greeks, and in her pallid face beamed soft, melancholy eyes, heavy, with an indefinable expression of voluptuous sadness and passionate ennui. Her mouth, with its disdainful curves, protested by the living warmth of its burning crimson against the tranquil pallor of her cheeks, and the curves of her neck presented those pure and beautiful outlines now to be found only in statues. Her arms were naked to the shoulder, and from the peaks of her splendid bosom, which betrayed its superb curves beneath a mauve rose tunic, fell two graceful folds of drapery that seemed to have been sculpted in marble by Phidias or Cleomenes. In sight of that bosom, so faultless in contour, so pure in its outlines, magnetically affected Octavian. It seemed to him that those rich curves corresponded perfectly to that hollow mold in the museum at Naples, the statue which had thrown him into so ardent a reverie, and, from the depths of his heart a voice, cried out to him that this woman was indeed the same, the very same, who had been suffocated in the via of Arius Diomedes by the cinders of Vesuvius. What prodigy, then, enabled him to behold her living, and witnessing the performance of the Casina of Plautus? But, he forbore to seek an explanation of the problem. For that matter, how did he himself happen to be there? He accepted the fact of his presence as in dreams. We never question the intervention of persons actually long dead. 
but who seemed to act nevertheless like living people. Besides, his emotion forbade him to reason. For him, the wheel of time had left its track, and his all-conquering love had chosen its place among the ages passed away. He found himself face to face with his chimera, one of the most unattainable of all, a retrospective chimera. The cup of his whole life had in a single instant been filled to overflowing. While gazing upon that face, at once so calm and passionate, so cold and yet so replete with warmth, so dead, yet so radiant with life, he felt that he beheld before him his first and last love, his cup of supreme intoxication. He felt all the memories of all the women whom he ever believed that he had loved vanish like impalpable shadows, and his heart became once more virginally pure of all interior passion. The past was dead within him. Meanwhile, the fair Pompeian, resting her chin upon the palm of her hand, turned upon Octavian, though feigning the while to be observed in the performance, the velvet gaze of her nocturnal eyes, and that look, fell upon him heavy and burning as a jet of molten lead. Then she turned to whisper some words in the ear of a maid, seated at her side. The performance closed. The crowd poured out of the theater through the vomitories, and Octavian, disdaining the kindly offices of his friend Rufus, rushed to the nearest doorway. He had scarcely reached the entrance when a hand was laid lightly upon his arm, and a feminine voice exclaimed in tones at once, low, yet so distinct that not a syllable escaped him. I am Tai Chi, Novalia entrusted with the pleasures of Aria Marcella, daughter of Arius Diomedes. My mistress loves you. Follow me. Aria Marcella had just entered her litter, borne by four strong Syrian slaves, naked to the waist, whose bronze torsos shone under the sunlight. The curtain of her litter was drawn aside, and a pale hand, starred with brilliant rings, waved a friendly signal to Octavian, as though in confirmation of the attendant's words. Then the purple folds of the curtain fell again, and the litter was borne away to the rhythmical sound of the footsteps of the slaves. Tai Chi conducted Octavian along the winding byways, tripping lightly across the streets over the stepping stones which connected the footpaths, and between which the wheels of the chariots rolled, wending her way through the labyrinth with that certainty which bears witness to thorough familiarity with the city. Octavian noticed that he was traversing portions of Pompeii which had never been excavated, and which were, in consequence, totally unknown to him. Among so many other equally strange circumstances, this caused him no astonishment. He had made up his mind to be astonished at nothing. Amid all this archaic phantasmagory, which would have driven an antiquarian mad with joy, he no longer saw anything save the dark, deep eyes of Aria Marcella and that superb bosom which had vanquished even time and which destruction itself had sought to preserve. They arrived at last before a private gate, which opened to admit them, and closed again as soon as they had entered. Octavian found himself in a court, surrounded by ionic columns of Greek marble, painted bright yellow for half their height, and crowned with capitals relieved with blue and red ornaments. The wreath of Aristolochia suspended its great green heart-shaped leaves from the projections of the architecture, like a natural arabesque, and near a marble basin framed in plants one flaming rose towered on a single stalk, a plume flower in the midst of natural flowers. The walls were adorned and paneled fresco work, 
representing fanciful architecture or imaginary landscape views. Octavian obtained only a hurried glance at all these details, for Tai Chi immediately placed him in the hands of the slaves who had charge of the bath, and who subjected him, notwithstanding his impatience, to all the refinements of the antique therme. After having submitted to the several necessary degrees of vapor heat, he endured the scraper and felt cosmetics and perfumed oils poured over him in streams. He was reclothed with a white tunic, and again met Tai Chi at the opposite door. She took him by the hand and conducted him into another apartment, gorgeously decorated. Upon the ceiling were painted, with a purity of design, brilliancy of color, and freedom of touch. This bespoke the hand of a great master, rather than of a mere, ordinary decorator. Mars, Venus, and love. A phrase composed of deer, hares, and birds, disporting themselves amid rich foliage, ran around the apartment above a wainscoting of cipolo marble, the mosaic pavement, Marvelous work from the hand, perhaps, of Sosimus or Paragomus, represented banquet scenes in relief, with a perfection of art which deluded the eye. At the further end of the hall, upon a biclinium, a double couch, reclined Aria Marcella in an attitude which recalled the reclining women of Phidias upon the pediment of the Parthenon. Her pearl-embroidered shoes lay at the foot of the couch, and her beautiful bare foot, purer and whiter than marble, extended from beneath the light covering of byssus, which had been thrown over her. Two earrings, fashioned in the form of balance scales, and bearing pearls in either side, trembled in the light against her pale cheeks. A necklace of golden balls, with pear-shaped pendants attached, hung down upon her bosom, which the negligent folds of a straw-colored peplum and a Greek border in black lines had left half uncovered. A gold and black fillet passed and glittered here and there through her ebony tresses, for she had changed her dress upon returning from the theater, and around her arm, like the asp about the arm of Cleopatra, a gold serpent with jeweled eyes was entwined in the many folds and sought to bite its own tail. Close by the double couch had been placed a little table, supported upon Griffin's paws, inlaid with mother of pearl, and freighted with different viands served upon dishes of silver and gold, or of earthenware enameled with costly paintings. A Phasian bird cooked in its plumage, was visible, and also various fruits, which are seldom seen together in any one season. Everything seemed to indicate that a guest was expected. The floor had been strewn with fresh flowers, and the amphorae of wine were plunged into urns filled with snow. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams.